you know, me and you were joking how it's when we were at the college, at the master's college, and, you know, we were maybe thinking about getting into ministry, you more than me, and I, I had made the choice not to do I was pursuing other things, but, like, it's every, you know, young man's theological aspirations mm -hmm. to get some time at the Shepherds Conference. Like, that's just what you, you know, no one says that, but every young man who's a preacher, you know, they want, you know, that's the goal. They want to be a part of the, that big glorious machine, you know, the, the theological notoriety of being there, the, that, that's, that's what it is to arrive. So in a weird way, <laughs> you, you've arrived, right, Russell, you're there. You, uh, I made it into the conference, you 2023. In, you made it into the Shepherds Conference. Not the way I thought I would make yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> One last point. Am I already over time? Yes, I am. But I'll finish this. That, you can leave if you want. You won't offend me. Okay, that, that, that theology professor's blog post about John MacArthur and the gospel according to Jesus makes the claim that John MacArthur overstates the seriousness of the antinomian error. And in support of that charge, he links to a YouTube video that was made by a guy who identifies himself as a graduate of the Master's University with a degree in biblical studies. And it's a 21-minute video in which this TMU grad is sharply critical of John MacArthur and his teaching on the Lordship of Christ. And specifically, he refers to a sermon John MacArthur preached, I think, two years ago, three years ago. It had to be longer than that. It was our last, maybe four years ago, Truth Matters Conference. John was preaching on Jude 4, where Jude warns about ungodly persons who, he says, have crept into the church unnoticed and who turn the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ, which is a perfect description of no Lordship doctrine. And and in fact, that's exactly what Jude is addressing, the extreme antinomians, no lordship devotees. And in that sermon, John MacArthur mentioned a comment that had been posted on social media by a master seminary grad, a pastor, who was renouncing lordship salvation using this sort of classic antinomian rhetoric. John didn't name the guy, but this video critic knew who the author of the tweet John was referring to, and it was a friend of his, and the guy made this video to support this guy's views, and he was angry, and his ultimate claim was a criticism of John MacArthur for suggesting that love for Christ is the identifying factor of genuine faith. I, I know my faith is real because I love Christ. And he said, no, no, that's law, not grace. That's the first and great commandment, thou shalt love the Lord your God. So you're preaching law, not grace. You've turned faith into a matter of law. And he was especially torqued that John MacArthur treats radical no lordship doctrine as a kind of serious and disqualifying error. Because John has said that for many who buy into the no lordship style of antinomianism, that doctrine will propel them in a direction towards total apostasy or disqualifying sin. Here's the thing. That guy's critical video was posted in October of 2019. That's a little more than three years ago. Two years later, that same guy started posting videos explaining why he was deconstructing, meaning he had decided to abandon Christianity altogether. He divorced his wife. He renounced his faith. In other words, although he was incensed at John MacArthur's suggestion that the brand of antinomianism he had embraced would push him into apostasy or sin, that is precisely what happened. And in the past year alone, this guy has uploaded more than 15 videos deconstructing the faith that he once professed to hold. But he's still keen to claim that he hasn't gone totally atheist. I looked at his most recent video, and at the end of it, he says, quote, I am very spiritual. I don't know that I'm a Christian. Of course, Jesus wasn't a Christian. But he says, but listen to this, he says, I definitely love others. I love God. I love myself. I'm not an atheist, contrary to what many of you, I think, assumed. Um, I am very spiritual. Um, I don't know that I'm a Christian. Of course, Jesus wasn't a Christian. So, um, but I definitely, I definitely love others. I love God. I love myself. And I'm trying to grow into more of an understanding of what that, that looks and feels like and to embody that at a deeper level, um, building healthy relationships with others, with myself and with the universe. Now, given that his whole argument three years ago was that love for God is a legalistic standard of spirituality, I guess this guy has become a legalist himself. <laughs> anyway, back to the theologian blogger who cited that guy three years ago as documentation for his claim that John MacArthur was exaggerating the danger of no lordship doctrine. What did he do with that link after this guy actually confirmed John MacArthur's point by becoming an apostate? He quietly deleted it without noting that the expert opinion he had cited came from a guy who did, in fact, subsequently abandon the faith. Made it into the conference, you 2023. It, you made it into the Shepherds Conference. Not the way I thought I would make yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just very funny to be that. I, I didn't think I'd be an example of what not to do. Sure. But, hey, 
I'm sure. sure. And I'll tell you, you know, one example <laughs> of like how fast life can change and the trajectory of what we believe and how we live and where that ends up. Mm. But I, I guess just when you heard this and as you were processing, what was that like for you to hear? What was your initial sort of gut reaction? Then how, how did you sort of reason your way through it? Like, how did you put it in context? What was that process like for you? Mm. So my initial reaction was being very amused for the reason that you just you know, kind of jokingly said, like, I've arrived. Like, they're talking about me. There is some amusement to that. Sure. Of getting the recognition, getting the attention. Um, thinking about the fact that Phil Johnson has watched my content and at least the entire most recent video that I've posted. Um, so it was humorous yeah. to me in a way. Um, I think that I am at this point so far removed from that mentality that there wasn't any sense of shame um, or weight to their opinion of me at this point um, because I kind of took two, their two steps removed. I went more into the um, historically reformed grace-centered camp first and then um, from there at the time what I called, I don't know that I use the term deconstruction anymore. I think I just left that version of faith for myself. Um, so I was two steps removed. So it was amusing. It, it was amusing that they're still talking about that video now four years later because um, it was posted in 2019 and it's not even on my YouTube channel anymore. Um, but then I think if I'm very honest, um, this is kind of sad to me too. Kind of bummed you out? It kind of bummed me out. Um, kind of a Like, if I'm totally transparent, they're, like, beneath the amusement and, like, the funny, um, there's a little bit of sadness yeah. around, like, if they really do think I'm apostate, they're sharing a laugh over me for the sake of upholding their theology. And that's the fucking reason why I left that shit. Yeah. Because that is what it is for them. It's a, it's a theological system, um that puts doctrine over people. And did you feel when you listened to that initially and when you listen to it now, did you feel like more an object example than a person? Like, did you feel that sort of, of derision, if that's the right word, the, the mocking, did you feel like that's the tone that came through? Of course. Um, Which I know they will hate because anytime we talk about tone or they get tone brought up in those circles, uh, they, they see it as a weak argument. Um, they're not much for tone policing, so right. to speak. Yeah, I know they don't care about that. But it's a legitimate, I think, you know, critique in that sense. But I don't think, maybe there's a way in which they think, well, he's so far gone, leave him to Satan or whatever their perspective sure, is. Sure. But there's no way in which, to me, that is worth what they're trying to communicate. It doesn't in any way make me feel like I made a mistake for walking away from that it's it's almost yeah. affirming so let, let me ask you do you maybe a little bit of a tough question here but do you feel in any sense what he said is true like was there any part of you having experienced it having gone through what you've gone through sort of had your dirty laundry aired out that says oh man maybe there was a wink not necessarily theologically but you know was it true was was grace theology just a way of your brain working something else out. Because um, obviously I know you don't think that his critique is right, that it was this theology of grace and it was this antinomianism that led you astray. Like, I, I know you don't think No, that. no. Yeah, correlation is not causation. Right. But there are correlations, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think... I think when I was at Masters, as an individual, I was extremely repressed. And I think at the bottom of who I am, the grace theology allowed me to finally relax. So explain what, what you mean by repress and like how that felt. Repressed how? In terms of 
because we use it as a sort of a blanket term in right. terms of like your development, in terms of like what you were willing to, to question or try to understand. Yes, it was about questioning and authenticity. Um, in those circles, the expectation is, which is the exact tone. I mean, just like Bill Johnson did in that video, um, if you don't believe like we do, we're going to shame you, right? And when you're in those circles, you can feel that. And so you either submit or you get off the pot. Yeah. Um, and so when you're in that type of environment, you you really just have to fall in line. And that's what I did. That's, that, that's what I mean by repressing. I wanted to be the best version of what they want to be. Yeah. I wanted to... I wanted to be a good Christian. I wanted to honor God. You know, I believed everything they said. I mean, John MacArthur to me was like a grandfather in a way. I yeah, internalized yeah. what he said. I wanted to be like him. Um, but at some point, I realized I wasn't being honest with certain aspects of who I was. And so I think that grace theology was a, a step that allowed me to start being more honest. And that's not all it was for me. I actually think from a theological perspective, there's more merit in the grace theology I had than what is taught at the master's college. Um, I think it was still a more conscious view of spirituality. So I think it was progress, but yeah. there were definitely connections between the freedom that that gave me to be honest and me making that, that transitional move, which then later progressed further. Um, I, I think what I would say though to your question is, the leap of saying, well, this specific view leads to apostasy um, is a very, very black and white assumption that doesn't accurately represent how things unfolded for me. Because I know plenty of people in the grace circles I was a part of that have been part of the circles for years and will die in those circles. Um, so I don't think that you can make an argument that one way of seeing the world is more prone to deconstruction than another one. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, yeah, I think that was my general, um, when I listened to this, because I listened to the whole sermon, um, and I, I think my initial thoughts just were on the substance of it were, um, I think there's a tendency to look for compromising bias in kind of these theological circles, and, and I think what happens is, and you see it time and time again, specifically in the master's world, when Ravi fell, Everyone, it's like, oh, we knew it was going to happen because, you know, we had a sense because he was too intellectual. You know, that was the critique mm -hmm. that came out of that, you know. Um, and so when you have these examples, when Driscoll, when that went under with right. Mars Hill, it was like, well, of course, we saw it, we knew it. Um, and so it, th there seems to be this tendency that there, where there is moral fa failings in the worlds of doctrine and theology that they oppose, that they think are unhealthy, or unscriptural would be, you know, a better way of, of saying that. Um, it's directly due to the unscriptural, inaccurate nature right. of whatever that doctrine is. But whenever there's moral failings within their world, it's nothing to do with their right. doctrine. It's a major double standard. It well, yeah, and that's that's how confirmation bias sort of works. You always look for what sort of confirms your worldview. It's it's similar to the type of. I would say psycho psychological phenomenon that happens with evangelists in, in this type of uh, theological community. Mm -hmm. When someone dies of renown and they're not a Christian, you won't get a bunch of evangelists on social media weeping with those who weep, saying, I'm thinking of, this is just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of Christopher Hitchens. Right, he passed. I'm, th I, I, I'm thinking of his, you know, his wife, his children, the tragedy of his loss, what they must be feeling, I'm feeling for them on a human level. Rarely will you ever see that. What you'll see a lot of Christians in this world do is they'll jump directly to, you know what, Christopher Hitchens would tell you that you need to repent right now if he could tell you anything, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll find some version of that message, you know, and there's almost a borderline giddiness is a little, that's a little, harsh word to use, but there is a sort of elation that comes with the opportunity, the opportunity to, to confirm their worldview and say that this person is in judgment. Right. And there's no compassion in what they're saying. And they'll try to paint it in terms of, you know, we're, we're doing our evangel evangelistic duty. Right. You know, and mission. it's a similar thing it is 
here is there is there is a sense of you know elation i would say there is a sense of gratification would be a better word yeah there, there is a sense of gratification in the fact that this oh, example told so. to, yeah. yep it's the you know i told you so this confirms exactly what we thought mm -hmm. it's the yeah. object example and in a way they're being consistent you know paul when someone shipwrecks their faith he does get a little snarky you know, he does, so maybe that's kind of their theological framework where it's like, they would not say it's a lack of compassion, but it's, it's, it's biblically founded. But I just think it's completely inconsistent and it's not even compelling in that way because it's, it's not rational. I mean, I mean, to make a serious comparison between the no lordship that came out of Dallas Theological Seminary and Zane Hodges and right. all the, the crazy stuff that that entailed, and the reformed, grace-centered movement that has deep roots in a Lutheran view of sanctification that is deeply theological, that you won't have one example of uh, the type of easy believism language that you find in No Lordship. So to, to make that serious comparison and to think it holds, right. I think, is just, it's borderline... Um, I think it's borderline in bad faith. I don't. I. I wouldn't necessarily say Phil Johnson is acting in bad faith, but I do wonder how deeply he is actually read into the grace centered theology portion to understand its roots. You know, as he talked to the. You know, it's easy to say, look at Tolin Tavigian, right. and as the poster boy of why you shouldn't go there. But is that what it was really about? You know, for Tolin, was it really? You know, it's, it's easy to find that confirmation bias, but you know what? For every master seminary grad that falls away from the faith, for every one of them that has a moral failure, for every one of them that acts out, for people of a different theological circle, that confirms what they think about masters. I know. That the reason it happens in masters is because there's not enough grace, let's say, or they're too legalistic, you know, or they're, they don't give in fully to the spirit. So they're, they're you know, um, stripping their students of a full spiritual life because they're sensationists for another example. Right. So it, it's the same sort of every sort of lens that Phil Johnson and, and the whole crew put on these experiences and other theological camps, other theological camps put on them. Right. And that's just the whole, you know, loop. That's why everyone just kind of stays in their echo chamber okay. of theological belief. And so I just think that my initial takeaway was that I, I wish there was a more serious, like, if you're going to draw that comparison, I, I just feel like you have to differentiate because they're, they're, they're not the same thing. Yeah, but that's the whole point of this is that from their perspective, if it is an echo chamber, it, it automatically creates a black and whiteness for anything outside of that circle. It doesn't matter if there's nuance or distinction between Zane Hodges and Westminster Seminary. Right. West. Right. It doesn't matter because they're not agreeing with what they're saying, right? So that's what they're focused on. They don't care about the nuance. Um, and again, I think to your point, I don't think, I don't think they're intentionally doing it in bad faith. I think they have such a need to see things the way that they see things. Um, if if they allowed nuance, their perspective of the world could not survive. Yeah, maybe that's true. I, I also think that maybe it's an issue of like, I don't know, wiring. Um, what do you and mean? Meaning, I think I think if you look at the type of people that go in and to and stay in, say, the master's world right. of like a really strong, you know, reformed, heavy emphasis on. Uh, external Marxist sanctification, um, kind of the, the really heavy emphasis on holiness, holy living. The people that stay and thrive in that movement are wired a certain way, have certain personalities. And if you look at the people that stay and thrive in the grace movement, you know, maybe it's the Mockingbird crew in, in Zoll. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's um, Steve, I'm, I'm spacing his name. Steve Brown. Steve Brown. And I think if you look at their wiring, and the way they see the world and the way they interact with people, you know, they're, they're, they're unilaterally, in my experience, a little bit more empathetic. They feel a little bit more with right. other people. Um, I think that also has a lot to do with it. That like, what, 
or sometimes seen in, in the theological differences is just a, a, a matter of wiring. Because it's exactly because ultimately I don't think it's about the theology. The theology is just an expression of something deeper. Um, and maybe this is coming from my psychological bias, but I think there's a deeper need being met. Um, it feels extremely safe to have black and white categories for the way you see the world. It's a very safe place. It's a, I know you and I have talked about this before, but sometimes I miss having that. Sure. That level of safety. But for me to have that again, I would have to compromise my honesty and my authenticity. And, and I think that's the thing beneath the thing, right? Um, so I, I, I wanted to say, you know, back when I made that video about John MacArthur, I was in a much different place. Um, I was in a reactive place. Um, I think Phil, is, Phil could probably feel my anger a little bit. I was yeah. frustrated. I was defensive. I was having issues with my own family who really resonated with MacArthur at the time. Um, and at that time for me, I was just kind of coming out of my shell um, about what I believed. I was posting videos on YouTube. I hadn't been honest and completely transparent out of fear. Um, I didn't want to be shamed by my family. I didn't want to be shamed by people in general. And so there was probably a good seven, eight years that I was pretty quiet as I moved into this grace theology. Um, but after a while, I wanted to just be vocal about it. Um, but I, I bring that up just to say that at that time, I was doing the same thing that Phil, I, I think that Phil is still doing. And I was, well, just pendulum swinging to another side. Um, and I was more seeing the world about from the standpoint of what I'm against. Yeah. It was it was reactive. Um, and I don't think that's where I am anymore. I think everybody kind of goes through, you know, when our beliefs drastically change, we have to go through the reactive states. There's no, in most cases, there's no way not to. But I think at this point, um, I don't have any hard feelings internally towards Phil. I don't have any hard feelings. Like, I think... Phil and John MacArthur are very, very decent people. Um, and I respect them. My views are different than theirs are. Um, but they're, they're authentic, they authentically believe what they believe. They're not trying to hurt anybody. They're not trying to put anybody down. Um, and, and from Phil's perspective, even the humor, I'm sure, and, and just the, uh, what was the word you used? about um, just them kind of chomping at the bit to... Uh, uh, the uh, sort of... The... Elation. Or... The elation, the gratification they get from it. Yeah. Um, but I think even beneath that, the reason there's gratification is because in their mind, they think they're protecting the flock. Yeah. I'm, I'm, to them, I'm a wolf. Sure. Right? Like, so if people discover my YouTube channel and are swept away by the, whatever I'm saying, I'm dangerous. Right. right. So they're just being consistent with their worldview. And I respect that because I know how they see the world. I've seen the world the way that they see it. And I think that's the ultimate motive. I don't think Phil is being trying to be rude or trying to come across in a certain way. Well, and part of that is just Phil. I mean, Phil's always had this biting sense of humor. Right. Like, that's what makes it's his personality. Like, it's, yeah. you know, back in, like, I don't know if you ever read the team Pyro blog, but that's what made him a really great writer is like he could really. That sort of, he's mm -hmm. kind of in, um, I, mean, I don't know if we would consider this a compliment, but like, sort of like, he does, similar to what Doug Wilson does, with his interacting with his idea, kind of mocking um, right. certain ideas. And, and I think you're right, I, you know, you could accuse Johnny Mac of a lot of things, but being inconsistent is not one of them. But I also think that's a personality thing. Like, I, and I think that's why he was so easy, this brings up another point, is that I also think this is a wiring thing. Sure. Of... The, the 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 tweet they were interacting about how they got um, the critique over affection for Christ being the primary mark. Of the that's what faith. that's what I said. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I said. I mean, it wasn't the tweet. I was the one in the video that said that John MacArthur said that you know you're a Christian because you love Christ, and I said no. Right, and and I think the 
Yeah, that's correct. The, I think the issue with that is also kind of a matter of wiring. Cause like for someone that's very consistent, maybe doesn't even know conceptually what depression is, not an emotional human being, right. affection means something completely different right. than someone who's very emotionally wired, who's up and down, who struggles with their emotions, who wakes up some days and can't find anything, any affection for anybody. Right. Like, I, I don't think there's a category, a way to explain that to someone who doesn't go through that. And I right. think that that's, that's also the issue of contention, is you're defining characteristics of, like, in this case, saving faith, based on the way you're interpreting reality through your experience Projecting. and your personality. Projecting, yeah. Um, so if you were to ask, even within the, the world, you know, that tight reform world, if you were to ask John MacArthur what affection is in the life of a Christian or in the life of a human, and then yeah. if you were to ask John Piper what affection is and does that way for him, you know, I think it'd be different. It'd be, so I think that's also the issue is that it gets so messy when you start putting these high stakes terms like, Marks the saving faith in language that is consistent with like your personality and the way you experience the world. Right. But that is kind of, I think that's what gets at the root of, of the differences and the lack of empathy. And the, you know, even if Phil Johnson would have said, like, look, like, I think that grace centered theology and no lordship salvation end up in the same place and that eventually they make the same error, it's the same oversight, but they are not the same of the same substance. Right. You know, a, I think a good faith assessment, if you actually, you know, are listening to, you know, consistent reform, grace-centered thinkers, believers, and you compare that with no lordship, I don't think you can just draw this sloppy little line between the two, but that's always what happens in these really controlled worldviews. Right. It's the same error that they weave with church history. Whenever you... Like, whenever I learned church history in these spots, they never talk about the plurality of belief in early church. They never talk about how messy that is. If they do, it's heavily glossed over. How could they? And they kind of weave, they imply that there's been this one clean line of orthodox belief from scripture to the beginning of the church. And why do you think now. they need to do that? It's, it's the same reason. It's the same reason. It's because to allow to allow for that variety or to allow for that uncertainty nuance. for the nuance, I don't think they have the right mechanisms to be able to deal with. I don't think they're comfortable dealing with it. It's I don't think they I don't think they think it's true. I don't think they're actively saying we're ignoring this, but I I don't even think they they see that. Right. But it's the same sort of error they're making. Yeah, I, what you're hitting on honestly the nail of the head of what started making me question everything related to my faith. Um, it was for me and I talk about this in the book that I've written, one of the biggest dominoes for my deconstruction or just me reorienting, you know, they, they would say leaving my faith. I wouldn't say leaving my faith. I still have faith in something. Um, there's a part of me that's still very Christian. Um, but it was the realization that every single person in this world has a subjective experience. That the way that Phil Johnson experiences his life is drastically different than the way I experience mine. As you mentioned, emotion, the way that we define terms, the way that John MacArthur experiences emotion is different from you and me and everybody else. And the entire premise of this movement is we're standing on truth. But the underlying assumption of that idea of truth is that truth is um, objectively existent, like out here, and, and we just got to kind of find it. And there's this assumption that the way that we see it is most safely consistent with truth, right? And that's the black and whiteness. The reality is, is there some sort of coherence in the universe we live in? Absolutely. That's why you can't just pretend that you're a bird and want to go fly and then fly. You, that doesn't work. And they make that point a lot in, with defending their ideas of truth. But just because there's coherence in our human experience does not mean that we all experience things the same, that we understand terms the same and that we experience things through the same lens and so i would say another reason that for me going changing camps might have also led to my deconstruction is i was able to see two different perspectives yeah. and i started internalizing the idea that 
there's a lot of good people out there that see things very differently. And there's a lot of consistent and objective people that see things very differently, um, that, that are also consistent in their own way. Um, but that's a very scary reality to accept that not only church history is not a clean line, that theology is not a you know, straight, pretty little line, and that our experience of the world is not objectively tied to our vision yeah. of everything. And I think earlier when I was talking about the thing beneath the thing, I think that's it. Yeah. I think the thing beneath the thing is that we experience the world in a certain way. And if our view of God is that he is some objective truth outside of us that we're trying to align ourselves with, which that's what they believe, um, then it makes complete sense that they would handle situations this way because in their perspective, they think that they are most aligned. And so anyone out of alignment is, is a danger. It's, it's not safe. Um, and I think for people that end up leaving their faith, I know for me, this is speaking from my own experience, there's a, almost a lesser need to always feel safe. There's a greater internal capacity to not always have clear answers to difficult life questions. And so I think that's why ultimately I can watch this video and it's now more amusing to me than it is hurtful, even though there's a part of me that's kind of sad. My ultimate perspective of it is um, Phil needs to believe what he needs to believe and I don't have any issues with him. I think I don't want to change his perspective. I'm not going to. I'm not going to change John MacArthur's perspective. There's space in my world for them. I think what we're trying to articulate beneath everything is the fact that the opposite is not true, that there's not space in their world for other people. Right. And I think that's... Yeah. Maybe some things, a couple things, just maybe if there is a correlation between grace theology and going astray or shipwrecking your faith, falling away, whatever term you want to put, deconstruction, even though I hate that term. Um, uh, and I hate it because, not because of the critique of it, but actually the way it's propagated by people who deconstruct, it's just... Mm -hmm. It feels very religious to me. Like it feels like a, another form of conversion. Um, yeah, it's another ideal. It's, yeah, it's another ideal. I just, I don't think it's the best. But I, I think if there is a correlation, maybe it's that when you buy into grace and you actually believe in a sort of unconditional love from God, which is what we're talking about, like like unconditional love from God as articulated through that reform grace and it it frees you from the fear of being honest. And having grown up in a variety of different kind of fundamentalist worlds, some more like really strict than others, um, and I think in strong theological traditions interacting in that, like in masters, I would say for myself there is such an intense pressure internally because there is real belief, um, and you do buy in to the system of, you know, whatever that, that may look like for you, whether it's, you know, reformed or whatever, and, and you want to believe, and you want to squash the parts of you that are out of line with that. Mm -hmm. You want to kill those parts more than anything in your life. Like, my desire to put to death those parts of myself that were not in line with what I consider orthodox belief, mm -hmm. it was a war. Yeah, it was a war. If someone would have given me a pill to shut that voice up and to take care of those areas where I consistently struggled with sin, I would have taken you that. Taken I, in a heartbeat, dude. Yeah. No questions asked. Like it was a war. Um, and I think what can happen is sometimes when you enter into a theology that's so deeply rooted in, in unconditionality, there is this freedom to say, okay. Let's deal with the source of tension in myself that keeps pushing back. I keep trying to kill it. It keeps fighting back. It's a little voice that won't shut up. You know, let's see what's going on here. And if finally you can remove it because you're so scared to even do that in this context because you're, you're fighting for your right. soul. You're, you're, you're fighting for sanctification. Um, yeah, you're afraid God will be you're fighting you. the flesh. Yeah, there, there's tons of... There's the, tons the culture. Of, sure. There, there's just so many internal and external pressures. That I think sometimes there is, there is this thing that happens where that sort of belief allows you to just deal with it honestly. And can that end in completely walking away your, from the idea of Christianity? It can for some. Can that end, you know, for others, for like this, this much more, you know, 
non-fundamentalist view of your faith. That's kind of minimalist. It can for, for some. It did. I'm kind of in that camp right now. I have been for some time. I believe like two things about the faith, and that's probably how we'll say, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So can that happen? Sure. I'm a, I think that's a possibility, but I don't think it has to do with the specific doctrine. I think it has to do with the safety of trying to get at the truth for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think beyond that, to what you were saying about like the subjectivity of experience, I think that's always the balance. That's always the struggle. Because I don't even think that their position would be that we know the truth and we have a corner on it. I think their position would be that, that, that truth is intelligible and we have all the tools to access truth. And mm -hmm. truth about God, ultimate truth, is the most intelligible truth in the universe. Mm -hmm. And we have access to that conscious scripture whatever like i i think that is their worldview right and what i'm saying is personally i think they're wrong all right um i think they're wrong on a few things and i would like to change the perspective <laughs> like on those things honestly i would um but i think it's always that balance between i think the difference for me is how much of that truth is actually intelligible in an objective way and i think that's that's the difference because we all believe you have to believe somewhere that truth is intelligible of course right? You know, you got to stand on something, but like the level and the amount of gymnastics, say in, in like a doctrine, like the perspicuity of scripture and how strongly that's guarded in that circle, mm -hmm. that's necessary for truth to be as intelligible as they need it to be. Right. So th there's these things that hold up that requirement for truth to be that intelligible. And that's, right. that's where I think the disagreement is. They're acting in consistency with that. You know, I think what my view would be, what your view would be, is that it's, it, the truth isn't, it's just not that intelligible. And it doesn't allow for the variety of perspective experiences that actually exist in the world. Right. And I think that's where the disagreement is. Right. It, it gives you limited meaning to ascribe to people that see the world differently than you yeah. do. You have a very, very small subset. It, it's basically two. It's yeah. either they love God or they hate God. And if they don't, underneath it, if they don't articulate or experience the world the way that we do in, in, in certain confines, then they're God haters yeah. at, at the bottom of it all. That's, that's the belief. Um, and they're just trying to be consistent with, with the way that they, with the way that they see the scripture. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I just, I wanted to spend, spend some time just responding to this, um, to this video. Did you have any other thoughts or questions? Just, it's a weird moment. <laughs> it's such a weird moment. Um, yeah. But I am, yeah, I, I guess, you know, I hope, you know, that was somewhat healthy to, to kind of sort through. I was just very curious how it made you feel. And I knew it was important, you know, to, for you, to you, to respond. Um, and I think it, it, it was good in a sense, because I, I think, for a lot of people that are coming out that specifically this circle or similar circles, what the conversation about this has kind of led to, because they're, they're, you know, they're, there's a lot of people struggling in between of where they land on faith. And I think what this has allowed us to like discuss and kind of get at really gets at the heart of some of those issues for people about their experience of faith, about the cognitive dissonance they're experiencing, the, the fear of being honest, the not knowing whether their honest voice is something they should repress, whether it's, right. you know, th there's so many messy, hard things to sort through that I feel like if you just all sit down, if like, because it, it, it's so, it's such a big thing right now. If everyone could sit down, you know, including people like Phil Johnson and we can just have a really honest, open conversation about what's going on, about what the experience, you know, of our faith has been and, and what people are trying to sort through, you know, that may end up in, we end up on two different chasms and, you know, they view us as unbelievers. We view them as people who think differently, fundamentalists, you know, whatever that may end up happening. But I, I just think if we just have to able to have like a no holes barred, honest conversation, you know, where we could leave sort of the, the 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 heavy language of uh opposition and shame out of it and just talk as like human beings who are trying to sort this shit out i just think everyone would be better off yeah. so that's always my hope for these things yeah um and when I, when I see dialogue online because it's 
it's so easy to be unhealthy and it's so easy to be uh, unproductive and it's so easy to dunk on people regardless of what side. I see every side just dunking on each other at every chance. It's like the ultimate game of gotcha. That's what the internet has turned into an in internet culture. And I just think that if, if we can kind of strip that away for a moment and just have a real honest conversation and try to try to like propagate that and explore that, I just think so much, so many more people would be helped by that and so many more people would be better off. I think and so. at least then the lines would be clear. You know, good fences make good neighbors. You know, um, so that that's always my hope. Yeah. So that's kind of my closing thought on that. Yeah, no, I think that's a good thought. I think I'm a little more pessimistic um, from the standpoint of I would obviously love that, but I think a lot of what psychologically promotes a need for black and white thinking is fear. And people who are afraid can never have as good of conversations because we run from what we're afraid of. We put up protective barriers against what we're afraid of. And I think that's why more of those conversations don't happen. Yeah. Um, I think that's why, it just this is my subjective experience, but on the other side of Christianity, I've had much more open and honest conversations with people who yeah. are willing to just be real and authentic with what they think because they don't have those fears. Right. Um, and so I think that's always going to be the challenge um, is getting, getting around the fear because we're all afraid in our yeah. own ways. Um, so can we put that to the side and consider where someone else is coming from? Um, so I think it's, it's idealistic, but I think it's a good ideal to, to shoot for. Um, I wanted to just say something real quick before we finish this. Um, one thing we didn't really get into is, maybe this is a conversation for another time, just the power of, speaking of fear, good segue, the power of hell and really kind of motivating a certain view of the world, motivating behavior, motivating falling in line, because we didn't talk about that. I mean, we talked about shame, we talked about fear of God, but we never specifically said in this time we've been talking how big of a motivator hell was. I know it was for me. Um, it, the, a lot of the repression I had came from fear of hell. Um, and, and more specifically, not fear of hell per se, but fear of eternal conscious torment. Um, one sure. perspective yeah. of hell. Um, so I wanted to plug something real quick. So um, I've made a friend over the last couple of years. His name's Mark Karras. Mark is a therapist. Um, he is, um, he grew up in church. He was a Christian. I think, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he still dabbles in Christianity a little bit. Um, I don't know how he would describe himself at this point, but his focus as a therapist is specifically on folks with religious trauma. He's written a good book called Religious Refugees. That was really helpful for me and my journey. Um, and he, he recently wrote this book um, called The Diabolical Trinity. Um, and this book deals with just healing from hell trauma, basically. Um, I, from the time I was young, just the churches I went to, I mean, this stuff was like hell was very, we took it seriously. Um, mm -hmm. It was a very big motivator, um, you know, and people who believe in eternal conscious torment genuinely, I think, want to help people not experience that. Um, it's a core tenet of evangelism. Um, people don't want other people to go to hell. Um, and I think that's a noble thing. If you believe somebody's going to die and be punished, it makes sense that you would try to change, change their trajectory. Um, but I think also the other side of that coin is there's been a lot of psychological trauma done that takes years to heal from. Um, there's a lot of research on it. Um, and from a therapist perspective, um, Mark talks about that. So if you are a Christian, or if you are a non-Christian, whatever place you're in, whatever perspective you have, I highly recommend this book as a resource to um, really just dig into some of the psychological effects that perspectives like hell have on the human mind. Um, and whatever position you land in, I think it's good to consider um, if we believe God is good, if we believe um, he is the greatest good in the universe, I think it's good to challenge ourselves and think about um, ideas of hell. I, I Wherever I land long-term spiritually, I don't think eternal conscious torment should be the hinge point of our theology, and I think for a lot of people it is. Um, and obviously, for another episode, but there's really good theological, historical arguments for it not to be a part, a cornerstone of our theology. But, um, yeah, absolutely. So check out Mark's book. I'll put a link for it in the description. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for listening. Jimmy, thanks for asking me some good questions, yeah. and we'll see you guys next time.